I want to also tell you a little bit about what Governor Malloy is doing in Hartford. He is doing a lot of restructuring, as he has promised to do. I announced to you a day or two ago that he has consolidated the Departments of Energy as well as Environmental uh, Protection. And now he is proposing to reduce the number of budgeted agencies by a full 30% from 81 to 57 agencies. This is what he said. I've reduced my own staff in the governor's office by 15%, and I'm proposing to reduce the number of budgeted state agencies by 30%. So he said, when putting together my budget, I had to ask, what sense does it make to split the Department of Emergency Management and Homeland Security and the Department of Public Safety? It's true. It all sounds like the same thing, doesn't it? Or why are the Offices of Workforce Competitiveness and the Commission on Culture and Tourism standalone agencies apart from the Department of Economic and Community Development? And you know something? He's got something there, Governor Malloy, because the truth is that, and this is, you can study this in business school, that once people have jobs, particularly bureaucrats, there's an inertia that sets in. There is what sets in a pattern of make work of reasons not to fire and reasons to increase one's importance. So let's say you set up an agency. All of a sudden, the agency is proposing regulations to keep itself in power so it has a job to do. Because if it didn't have regulations to enforce, it wouldn't be able to justify its own salary. Am I right? So what we have is we have this increasing circle, this vicious cycle of regulation and then regulatory agencies and then more regulations and regulatory agencies as it becomes a self-fulfilling justification for them to to keep their jobs. But a lot of them have very similar names and very similar missions. And I think he's on to something. He asks, why are all, this is in a press release today, Governor Malloy, why are all of the government accountability functions, the Elections Enforcement Commission, the Freedom of Information Commission, the Judicial Review Council, the Contracting Standards Board, and the Office of State Ethics separate entities when so many of their issue areas and jurisdiction overlap. It didn't make sense. He says, quote, this is a large shakeup. I know there will be a number of questions, and in the coming weeks I'll answer those questions, and I'm going to work with people in Connecticut state government. But make no mistake, I am serious about these proposals. I am ready to work with the committees of cognizance in the legislature to make this happen. You know what he said on this show? I blogged about it, and you can go to the blog that's on LisaWexler.com, or you can just Google Lisa Wexler blog. It's a standalone blog. And what I said was, I repeated what he said just the other day on the show. He was on what, Tuesday? I think he was on Tuesday in the show. And he said that one year from now, the government of the state of Connecticut is not going to look the same, and he wants people to know that the rules of the game have changed. And I will t tell you, for a lot of these people, these bureaucrats that have been on the state payrolls, they've got to be a little shaky today. They can't be too happy. And it's going to be interesting to see how he lets them go, how he shrinks the payrolls. Because a lot of these people have contracts by virtue of being a member of the state employees union. So we're going to have to see what happens. It's not going to be merely attrition that has a lot of people losing their jobs. But you know what? I commend him because I've never understood the overlap. And there's something else here. The overlap is dangerous. When you have three agencies all responsible for emergency management and public safety, you have a danger that one may think somebody else is doing something that they're not doing, and they may think the other one is doing it, and therefore nobody does it. Or information is parsed between three different agencies instead of one knowing everything. Wouldn't you rather have one Department of Actual Emergency Management in the state of Connecticut so that in the event of an emergency, there's one person to go to or one department to go to and not three? Overlapping is not good in a lot of ways. It makes a mess of things. It's one of the reasons that federally we've made such a horror, as Dana Priest exposed in the Washington Post since 9-11, of the overlapping agencies for our own surveillance against our own people. We have so many people now that are internal spies against us that are charged with protecting us from ourselves that nobody is doing a decent job of it. The CIA looks the other way. We reported to you yesterday and promotes people that mess up. The FBI, how many people 
has the FBI let slip through its own fingers that it hasn't caught, including Major Hassan, who was on the target, on the radar as somebody that was a problem, that was a mental health problem, and yet he was able to commit the Fort Hood massacre. I mean, the truth is that we need to be leaner and meaner. I really believe that one of the reasons that World War II was so successful was because it was before the CIA was ever established. We had something called the OSS. You who know your history know what I'm talking about. And the OSS, which I think was the Office of Strategic Services, maybe it was something else, maybe it was the Office of Secret Services, was a loosely, a loosely aligned and not very well funded organization of people that stepped up to the plate that were very, very brave, that were our first spy network in Europe and Japan. And there was not a formal CIA. In fact, Harry Truman said that he regretted most in his years in office allocating money for the CIA. He thought it was the worst thing he did. Much like Eisenhower thought the worst thing he did was advance the military industrial complex. These men understood the before and the after. They didn't just have the after. And I think because the OSS was so lean and mean and loose, it was able to so effectively spy and break codes and do what it had to do to help us win the war. I'm not sure against an enemy like Germany was then today that we could do it. We have a highly stilted and stunted, a very unnimble bureaucratic force now out there. And if you read and I urge you to do so. Keep apprised of how much money is going into all of these sophisticated technologies. I don't think we're any of the smarter for it. We haven't caught Osama bin Laden. In today's front page news, it said that uh, Janet, what's her face, uh, N- Napolitano, I, I really, I don't like the woman. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said what's her face. It was, it was disrespectful of me. I really, I just have a, I have a visceral dislike to the woman. But anyway, she's the former governor of Arizona and the now head of Department of Homeland Security. She said today that the biggest threat to the United States is not any longer Osama bin Laden, who, by the way, was recently spotted in a video coming out of Afghanistan. She said it's this other, uh, it's Al Walaki, I think is his name. I'm going to try and find the exact name for you, who is a homegrown American-born citizen, who is the person who she thinks, and of course the Department of Homeland Security, who she's speaking for, thinks is our own greatest threat to our own American security. The greatest terrorist to America right now is somebody that's an American-born person. Can you believe that? That's what's going on. That's why I'm of two minds about what Peter King is doing. You want to talk about that? 203-845-3044. I, too, am afraid it could become a witch hunt against the Muslim community, which would be a terrible thing to do as Americans and also backfire as a matter of strategy. On the other hand, right? On the other hand, We have these homegrown terrorists right here. We have them. We know that they're here. They're not everywhere, but they're here enough to be concerned about. I just don't know if a congressional hearing is the right form to flesh it out or it will become like a witch hunt. I'm willing to wait and see a little bit, but, you know, my hackles are up because I don't want a repeat of what happened in the 1950s. It could go that way. I'm not sure what can be accomplished in such a public forum. On the other hand, maybe he's serving notice that America is finished not calling a spade a spade and we're done with an administration like Obama's administration refusing to label Islamic terrorists Islamic terrorists because that's offensive. When you don't call people who they are and you don't call them by their right name, you dilute what the American people need to know and you change the message. And you tell falsehoods and lies, and you don't keep us prepared for the real enemy. Because there is a movement. It's not everywhere, but it's real and it's true. And there is a movement of jihad, and it is in this country. And it is in some mosques, and it is in some Islamic schools, and it is in some communities. It is. And the fact of the matter is the FBI does need to ferret it out. I just don't want to see a congressional hearing accusing perfectly patriotic Americans who happen to be of the Muslim faith you know, of bad things that they didn't do. And I don't want to see people blackballed and their reputations ruined when they shouldn't be. So that's why I'm keeping an eye on it. That's why I'm of two minds about it. I think it's all in the execution. And I don't mean that literally. 